Axtenbaal is a paints and coatings uh, company uh, headquartered in, in the Netherlands in Amsterdam, 35,000 uh, employees and uh, we work day and night to make the best paints and coatings uh, to deliver to our customers in the world. I don't pretend to have all the knowledge in my head. Showing your weaknesses uh, is, is a strength actually, uh, so, and that's what I try to also uh, show. Uh, I, I can raise stupid questions, I, I don't necessarily know anything and I, I can also, I don't have problems to display it. I uh, had never the intention to become an IT leader, but now I am an IT leader, so yeah, that, that could um, never been done if I had to uh, put that dot on the horizon there. So you need to embrace the opportunities which they come, and uh, there will always come opportunities. This is Sierra TV. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm here today with Marco van Kempen, who is the director of the IT Center of Expertise at Axon Nobel. A very warm welcome, Marco. Hello, happy to be here. Marco, you have a master in economics from the Han University in Arnhem in the Netherlands in applied science. And you have worked for more than 20 years already at Axon Nobel in different roles, different fields. So Marco, tell us a little bit more about yourself, what's your background, who are you and how did you arrive in this position? Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, yeah, it's actually almost 25 years, so a uh, long serving history at Axnabel and mm -hmm. uh, that's also uh, what, what drives me here because I really like to work for this company and all mm -hmm. the challenges and the ambitions where we probably will talk about more later. But uh, yeah, I have that finance background, so I started in finance um, at Axnabel. Mm -hmm. Uh, predominantly at the chemicals part of Axonobel, uh, which is uh, divested, but uh, yeah, and then gradually I started to move on to other parts of the, the mm -hmm. company and other positions, uh, so I also landed in IT. You upgraded to IT. Yeah, <laughs> upgraded to IT, as, as we would now call it, uh, working in IT. And then after a while I moved back to finance and then I, I came back into IT, um, or did a major uh, ERP consolidation programs, uh, but then also managed uh, in the finance function shared service centers again. So actually this is my 11th position in Axnobel. Uh, so yeah, I, it, although it feels like on first sight that I stay long with this company, which is actually true, but it doesn't feel like this because I got that many opportunities to yeah. do something else and, and also cross functions, which uh, I think, um, yeah, Axnobel gave me these opportunities, trust and confidence in, in doing so and that uh, I really appreciate. Yeah. Uh, for those of us who don't know Axon Nobel, I mean, it's a, it's a big company, headquarters in the Netherlands. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more. What's the, what's the business uh, all about and what is it that Axon Nobel does really, really good? Yeah. So Axon Nobel is a paints and coatings uh, company uh, headquartered mm -hmm. in, in the Netherlands in Amsterdam, 35,000 uh, employees. And uh, we work day and night to make the best paints and coatings uh, to deliver to our customers in the world. Yeah. Paints, uh, then you can talk about uh, architectural paints, uh, window frame paints, but, uh, and coatings, then we talk about anything you put on, uh, on applications like cans or airplanes, cars, boats, shipyards, yep. anything, uh, windmills, uh, so anything uh, you can think of what needs color or needs protection or both. To, uh, to, uh, to serve our customers. So if we look around, we see a lot of your products probably. Yeah, you always, uh, they say sometimes uh, 25 meters away from any uh, uh, product which uh, has our color to, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to our paint or coat yeah. is to protect or color uh, the product. It can be your phone, it can be your computer, it can yeah. be a can of drinks, but also your house, any, any place, anything you can think yeah. of is, uh, as a caller. Or and it's really an international company, right? Yeah, we, we are present in 150 plus countries. Wow. So uh, uh, I think um, from all the paints and coatings company in the world, we are a top three player. And, uh, but I think we are by far the, the most global uh, uh, paints and coating companies mm -hmm. with presence in all parts of the world. Very strong provision, uh, positions in Latin America. But also um, in, in Europe we are very strong, but yeah, in any region uh, we, are, we have strong positions and, yeah. and we are more most global spread and diverse company. So that makes me really uh, yeah, feel proud about it, but also look at, uh, at our goals we have in Axonobel, like the sustainability goals, but also on um, yeah, other uh, aspects like people, paint and, 
a planet where we really want to take care of uh, how people feel and how they are uh, working at Oxnabel. It should be safe. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be diverse, yeah. but also economically, uh, environmentally friendly uh, products we build, but also the, the way we do business mm -hmm. in, in that way. So that. Uh, that kind of characterize uh, Oxnobel yep. as, as a global leading company. Very much innovative products we have. We do that also with collaborations with uh, parties uh, in what we call Paint the Future programs, mm -hmm. where we work and engage with uh, startup and scale up companies mm -hmm. uh, to define new products, yep. uh, small incremental innovation, but also breakthrough innovations where we uh, yeah, try to bring new products and create value for, uh, for the customer. Okay, so big international company, about 10 billion revenue, yeah. 35,000 people, global, 140 uh, countries, quite a challenge and interesting company to work for indeed. And uh, how, what would you describe as being the main business challenges today in, uh, in, in your business? Yeah, right now, uh, then uh, we talk all about uh, uh, margin management, huh? because you see, uh, you saw actually from post-COVID how we came as as global economy out of the COVID mm -hmm. uh, uh, with steep uh, raw material in prices, but also inter, yeah, uh, integrated supply chain uh, of supply chain uh, challenges as such in general. Yeah. Um, so that, that resulted into shortage of certain raw materials, uh, but also steep price increases. Uh, so that, I think, for our company were, were the two biggest challenges. And we still have that today. And in, in some aspect, actually, uh, it got even worse with the whole uh, Ukraine crisis, yep. uh, where we still uh, yeah, face uh, every day on the news, you can see the, yeah, the, the challenges it causes. Yep. So that, that makes us really uh, worrisome and, um, and how, how that will proceed or how quickly that will, uh, yeah, will uh, resolve. Most importantly, of course, for the people over there in Ukraine, because they suffer most, but, but also it, uh, yeah, it impacts our company, Axnobel. Yeah. It's really um, a challenging environment. So margin management and resolving the supply chain yeah. issue. We absolutely live in special times, huh? with an inflation, uh, war, supply chain, there's many, many things that, uh, that, that come together. So business has to really focus on, on, on margin management. How does that translate in IT strategies? Is the, what's the impact then? Yeah, you see that uh, the, the, the change, the mode of change in the world is, is increasing, right? It's uh, rapidly more, uh, changes come quicker and, and more intense and more deep. Uh, so that, that has a big impact on uh, how we need to operate as a company. Yeah. And that also impacts on uh, our strategy in IT uh, because we need to be more agile, be more flexible to, uh, to adapt to the uh, changing environment. Yeah. But most importantly, the insight we can give to the company on data or information, results. Because if you look yeah, a couple of years back, um, I think uh, because Axonobel came from a very decentralized organization, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about it hopefully a little bit more later, but that means that we were a very fragmented organization. So yeah. sometimes uh, if you look at results and data, the information uh, we could gather and could collect was very cumbersome. So that, mm -hmm. that made us in a position that we actually only once per month, we could kind of in a batch way see how the company did, yeah. uh, did perform. So, and now we are slightly moving towards a situation that we are I can see what is actually happening right now because we our strategy in IT is much more real time insight of information, yep. collecting more data points from internal environments, internal data lakes we have created, but also uh, yeah source external data to complement yep. that and and bring more data together and can make something meaningful out of that. And yep. that uh, that really helps us now in the strategy that we can almost real time can see how the margins are developing at our key customers, uh, what the key raw materials are developing. And actually we are now also moving more towards forward looking, uh, real time forward looking with external factors like oil price, currencies, but other uh, uh, major uh, gro uh, global economy indicators to determine how the growth will look like. Yep. Uh, so we slowly just move from uh, looking, looking back in what the, in, the, in the past, <laughs> what happened, yeah. and now we can see what is happening, and in the future we can see what will happen. Okay. Um, yeah, we do that now a little bit, but bits and pieces already, but we are more take a more structural approach in there, and, and that's one of the key elements in our strategy, okay. IT strategy. So a lot of data and. Uh, but also decomplexing our landscape. Yeah. Uh, that uh, because the data is hidden 
very well <laughs> in the past in our company. So. Just to make it clear, the, your uh, IT's center of expertise, you're responsible for all the core systems, the ERP systems and so on, is that correct? Yeah, so my team uh, is, uh, is, is responsible for the whole application lifecycle management, solution mm -hmm. architecture, design and build of all the IT solutions yeah. in the company. Yeah. And that is globally uh, across all functions, regions and uh, other uh, yeah, uh, indicators. Where, yeah. uh, but it's the full scope in, yeah. um, in that. And we are now embracing also on the, on the OT part of it uh, awesome. because that was also something what, what, uh, what was not centrally and well organized uh, mm -hmm. in that respect. So uh, we are stepping now up together with the functions and the business to see how we can uh, manage that uh, in a better okay. way. So your IT strategy is to becoming much more real-time and, and, and forward-looking and, and, and making sure that you can uh, supply the necessary data and insights to the company. Uh, and so I can imagine that ERP plays a central role, role in there. And, and, and the, one of the topics I wanted to discuss to you, uh, with you today is the future of ERP and how you see the future of, of ERP, SAP and, and, and others within uh, Axel Nobel. Um, you, and let's start from your historic background it was a very fragmented organization and, you, and there's now a, a, a business strategy to make it much more one company. So I understand that also from an ERP point of view, you had a very fragmented uh, landscape. So talk us a little bit through that. Yeah. So some historical uh, numbers gave me the insight that we had over, <coughs> sorry, 180 systems, ERP systems, but uh, that must be very long time ago. <laughs> I think in the recent uh, years where we were uh, combining and centralizing the IT function, mm -hmm. uh, which now is uh, yeah, fully implemented, of course, already for years, uh, mm -hmm. the last five to seven years, uh, we started also the ERP consolidation program in a more proactive, aggressive way. Yeah. And we uh, reduced from uh, uh, 50 plus ERP systems to, uh, to about uh, 24 today, mm -hmm. um, despite another 10 plus uh, ERP additions as a result of mergers and acquisitions. So we did a massive uh, application uh, ERP mm -hmm. reduction program. Um, but still you have 24. Yeah, I always lot. jokingly say uh, we, we move from a uh, company with many ERP systems to a company with many ERP <laughs> systems. So we still have a lot. Although I need to put it a little bit in perspective mm -hmm. because uh, 24 is still a lot. But if you look at our main ERP uh, system, um, that holds already two thirds of our business. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the top four uh, SAP ERP systems, then we talk about about 95% of our company. So 95% of our business is running on four SAP ERP systems. So in that sense, we, we came from far. We, yep. we have come far and, uh, and it's already quite well centralized. And uh, with CFIN on top and our analytics on top of that, we, we really have more uh, the most uh, real-time information. Uh, okay. Uh, and, what's the, and what's the target? How far do you want to go into this simplification? Yeah, currently we are running this uh, big ERP uh, consolidation program in Axe Nobel uh, called PRISM and that will, uh, that will last until um, at the end of uh, next year, 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we will pretty much at, at those four ERP systems, so 100% running on those four systems. Um, and then, in fact, the whole legacy of, of uh, uh, acquisitions in the past, or yeah. unfinished work in the past, has been resolved and we have taken out debt, yeah. not only from an application, uh, the architectural debt, uh, the, the number of applications we have, but also the, the outdated uh, uh, versions of those ERP systems yeah. are taken away. Yeah, and then uh, at, at the end of 23, and then we come on the big crossroad. Yeah. Uh, what do we do next? And yeah, we, uh, we talked about it a lot. Uh, we, we had a, an early discussion uh, about that as well. And I think, um, yeah, that is an important uh, step we can make as a company because we can choose to continue our consolidation program because we still have four ERP systems yeah. uh, and move it back to one ERP systems or embrace on the S4 technology yeah. because we are an SAP ERP based company and yeah. uh, that's also what we intend to, to, uh, to remain. Uh, but at some point we need to embrace the S4 yeah, technology. Yeah. It brings uh, benefits, but it is also to keep our landscape current because yeah. uh, it will run out of support at some point, I believe 2027. Yeah. 
Um, so then, then we meet, uh, need to make those choices. And, and actually right now we are talking to our businesses on yeah, what to do next, huh? what, what to go first. Uh, should, we, should we start to uh, grab the benefits of an S4 functionality mm -hmm. or should we uh, yeah, um, continue to reap the benefits of, uh, of a consolidated landscape? Yeah. Because not only IT is much more consolidated and centrally managed, but also other functions have gone through that process. Because mm -hmm. Axnobel was, again, a very decentralized organization, but now with the divestment of chemicals a couple of years ago, we are very centrally organized and focused paint and coating company. Yeah. And that, uh, that, um, that allowed us to, to much more centrally organize it. So you see that in manufacturing, in supply chain, in all kind of functions, we much more work together. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we are now kind of uh, yeah, her, uh, yeah, hindered by those many ERP systems. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these functions and businesses um, yeah, are asking for continuation of the, the consolidation program yeah. because that uh, brings them more benefits, takes out complexity, yeah. and also time to value for those projects because yeah. If you, for example, implement an e-commerce platform or consolidate the e-commerce platform, what we actually are doing, we, we still see more cost of implementation, longer time of implementation, because you want to connect them to the, the backbones, yeah. right, the ERP systems. And that is very complicated right now. Yeah. Different versions, different technologies, so that, that, that makes it very complex. So the time to value of those projects yeah. are longer. So there's a good business case to continue with the, with the simplification. Then. Yeah, on first sight, is what we, that's what we are looking at. But, no. uh, but yeah, we need also uh, look at uh, uh, carefully how we, uh, how we do this and, mm -hmm. and when the right time is. Um. No. I also understand, Marco, that you have implemented SAP CFIN. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, it's a good question actually because uh, indeed we, we are actually implementing CFIN. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have already implemented this for, uh, for uh, most of the business and in this summer uh, the whole world will be uh, connected to the CFIN, mm -hmm. uh, at least for the, to the extent they are in these four ERP systems. Yep. So we connect those four ERP systems to CFIN. And then you can consolidate everything? What's yeah, the, that, there? The, the, the first phase of that project is to consolidate and replicate financial data so that mm -hmm. we can see the data in a, in a real-time properly met and cleansed database mm -hmm. and, and that again we, we feed into our reporting tools uh, like SAC or Power yeah. BI but SAC is our more structured reporting uh, front-end tooling and that gives us much more insight but we decided also to do the financial processing more and more in CFIN. Mm -hmm. For example, dunning, cash collection, outgoing payments, yeah. treasury in the near future, maybe GRC functionalities, consolidation we are uh, uh, considering. So it's, it's, it will be really our uh, global finance uh, on top system mm -hmm. with S4 features because yeah. Finance was ready to embark on the S4 functionality and the additional features it will bring. Mm -hmm. So that's why we added on the, the CFIN uh, platform because the ERP consolidation program is already for years and will take a couple of more years before we really go to one system. Yeah. And finance function couldn't wait for that. Okay. And, and they wanted to uh, embark also on the S4 features. But this will also help us to, for future M&As eh, so that we more easily can connect them to the CFIN uh, environment and do quicker um, a consolidation and, 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 and get them into the global finance processing, eh? like payment processing, yep. dunning, cash collection, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so CFIN already allows you to do all this, uh, have this overview, have one uh, data, one view, uh, one, one consolidated view, without already having to go uh, a complete uh, S4 uh, for all yeah. the functions. Then. Yeah. But so the CFIN we have used is an S4 environment, but only for the CFIN part. Yeah. And we did it in the Greenfield environment. So we did a complete reset of the, the processes. Mm -hmm. We are not doing all the financial processes yet in CFIN. Uh, you can think about product costing. Yeah, you, you need to do that in the backbone system. Huh? Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that still remains in the four big ERP systems yeah. for now. But part of that journey we were just talking about is that there is also the option to consolidate into CFIN so that we bring all the logistics transactions and processes 
intrusive in as well and 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 that then becomes our greenfield like mm -hmm. um, erp um, uh, system yeah and that uh, that is one of the options we are considering right now as we yeah. speak so very interesting uh, to bring all these brains together from from internal from some our external company but also our software uh, supplier to see what uh, what the best options are yeah. so really exciting to 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 finish that hopefully still this yeah. year at least the thinking so that we can prepare ourselves uh, in uh, in our internal approval process but also the engagement we need to do uh, to uh, to be prepared when when uh, the prism consolidation is finished okay so Marco, let's also talk a little about on on infrastructure level uh, platform where where all this is happening uh, where are you today? Have you still have your own data center or you already have moved parts to the cloud? What, what, what's your cloud strategy? Yeah, so we, uh, we, we have an, uh, a cloud and less strategy. So we, we like the cloud actually because mm -hmm. it does do, uh, take away a lot of our concerns in terms of how you manage uh, performance, uh, CPU or whatever uh, aspects in, uh, in infra and hosting and technical application manager you can think of. Yeah, that uh, if that is that concern is taken away, we really would appreciate that. So that is that is what is covered in the in the cloud. Uh, uh, if you, if you bring it to the cloud, so no. yeah, we as a company really appreciate that. So because we, if you look at our scarce resources in the IT function in Axnobel, we would rather focus on process knowledge, integration knowledge, uh, data knowledge, rather than the more foundational no. technical uh, knowledge which I think uh, is better embedded in, yeah. in the companies where they invested millions in that knowledge and capability. Yeah. So we have that philosophy on any space, but also on the ERP uh, space. Currently, our ERP systems are still running on a, a private cloud, mm -hmm. so not on our own premise. Huh? So uh, we, we actually don't have any service within Axnobel anymore. There are still a few, but uh, not significant. Mm -hmm. So most of us is, are either in the cloud or they run in our uh, private data uh, center, which we, uh, we hosted with a party, one of our strategic vendors. Yeah. Um, c however, we have chosen for now to, to, to do that with SAP mm -hmm. and so-called hack uh, uh, engagement. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we actually now uh, trying to learn how that is working huh? in, in terms of services, response, performance. And, and that's all the, the SAP aspect. cloud then? Uh, yeah, that's what, uh, what is then the private cloud of uh, SAP. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, and I think that's now, uh, these days it's called uh, RISE, huh? it's the future. Uh, so that's, um, yeah, I think the, the, the predecessor of RISE is, is HACK in, in mm -hmm. my belief. And uh, that's what we have done for CFIN, and we are actually now learning how that is uh, working out for yeah. us. So you still have a couple of years ahead until you are in in one in one system, let's say that is that is really. Um, if we ever will get there, <laughs> because we continue to do mergers and acquisitions, yeah. so it's the ambition. Yeah. But in practice, uh, you always uh, we we just. Uh, I think a couple of weeks uh, announced uh, another big acquisition in Africa, uh, and and also there we become uh, yeah, a very strong uh, party in uh, the Africa continent. But that also brings a lot of uh, ERP applications uh, with it again, yeah. uh, like we also did with the recent uh, closed acquisition of Orbis Group in uh, in Latam, mm -hmm. where you also inherit new ERP uh, landscape. So you will continue to see. That, that new things will, will grow yeah. Uh, because, yeah, that's, that's I think, the, the one of the strategies in a grow and deliver strategy yeah. of Action to to, uh, to grow within the company, but also grow by uh, mergers and acquisitions. Yeah. And um, maybe a more philosophical question. I mean, ERP is an important platform and system in a company, but is it, is it, is it really s something that helps you to differentiate? Is ERP differentiating? No, we, we don't believe in that uh, ERP, the, the core, is uh, differentiating. Huh? So um, I think uh, you see it in these days that, uh, that the monolithic approach is gone. Huh? So, uh, and, and so the ERP, the core, is becoming a little bit smaller. And in that sense, I think um, it's not so much differentiating uh, mm -hmm. again. Still, uh, if you look at all our analysis in preparation for that important strategic decision we need to make, yeah. uh, we also did look at our RISEF, uh, our custom code in the systems. Yeah. 
And we also learned that we have a lot, okay. uh, not surprisingly, because we have some, some are older systems and uh, we built a lot in the past uh, to, uh, to whatever the business was asking for. Yeah. But we still see that 60% of that can go away. Okay. But we still see that, that also 40% might still be needed. So we are still in the progress like the how, how big should our ambition be to stick to really the standard. Mm -hmm. So we, we so it's a it's not black and white, it's a bit gray. I think it's not differentiating, but we still steal elements where we can create value by making smaller enhancements yeah. to that core. Uh, uh, to to make the process efficient for, yep. for the business creating the legacy of the future then or yeah yeah that's 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 one of the big questions we need mm. to ask uh, but for example um, we did implementation of an HR suite uh, we did the deceive implementation and there we raised really the bar uh, to uh, to 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 steerco level huh? and that's and and exco members are in there sometimes or exco minus one level in Axel and uh, that any non-standard change should be brought up to that level. So people had to really think through very well before any uh, change to the standard was, uh, was approved. And that, uh, that, that allows us to, to have a very minimal deviation in the current CFIN implementation and, for example, the HR Suite implementation, which happened to be also an SAP product yeah. success factor. So that's what we try to governance it, but we are still maturing there huh? because yeah. We, did, we had a very decentral organization. Currently, we have a central global process organization. Um, and you see that some are maturing quite well and have that strong ambition to standardize processes and to make them more global and, uh, and, uh, and um, yeah, reusable within the company. But that takes time. That takes time. So it a little bit depends on the maturity level where, where we think uh, where we can really stick to the standard. Okay. But by, by, st by default, it should be uh, non differentiating. And you say that the core ERP as such, the core is shrinking a little bit and, and, and you don't believe in monolithics where one system does everything. So let's talk a little bit about the different platforms, CRM, you mentioned HR, e-commerce. What are you using? What's the strategy for the different elements? Yeah, so the, the, the core is SAP, uh, and uh, we still run ECC, but have that plan to uh, move to S4. If you look at the HR, indeed, we have the HR suite, uh, which is uh, yeah, integrated to, uh, to our infrastructure, uh, but also to our ERP systems, and that is uh, the success factors of SAP. Then in supply chain, we are currently also implementing a new uh, supply chain suite in the name of OMP. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, yeah, in e-commerce, we are uh, establishing a, a central um, e of a, a suite for e-commerce uh, in the name of Adobe mm -hmm. with different products over there. Um, yeah, what more Magento, do Magento, I understand. Uh, Magento is the e-commerce platform, but also Marketo and AEM for, for the websites and, uh, and the marketing campaigns, etc. Oh, yeah. So there we use uh, the whole oh, Adobe. Adobe suite. Um, yes, CFIN is the, the, the finest on top environment, which yeah. we are currently implementing uh, as well. And then in CRM, we have our homegrown open source, uh, uh, what we call Gaudi CRM solution. So mm -hmm. there we, uh, we thought um, it would be good to, to, um, to extend what was already built for part of the organization to extend it to the rest of an organization. Yeah. Um, but we, we, we have some challenges over there because uh, to, to have your own open source CRM platform, you, you need to invest in keeping the system uh, um, and, and, and drive innovation yourself. Uh, because yeah. uh, normally with a SaaS product or uh, other products you buy, uh, you, you, can, you get the innovation as part of the, uh, yeah. the product. But here you need to kind of uh, develop and create your own innovation pipeline. Yeah. And sometimes, those funds needed for that uh, need to need to be sacrificed for something else, and there, that's a little bit the danger in a, in a company where we are not used to uh, uh, these open source platforms mm -hmm. where you need to drive innovation yourself. Then, yeah. uh, then it's a little bit of a challenge. So, yeah, that might be uh, something we we need to look at. But, yeah. and CRM is also heavily uh, CRM is one of these uh, sweet spots where you really depend the the. Um, the, the functionality drives the usage and the adoption eh, more. Uh, for example, an ERP system you have to use, otherwise you cannot do the shipment and the delivery and yep. the invoicing. But a CRM system 
yeah, it, it, uh, some people can uh, avoid using it. Uh, so that uh, so it is important that you have the right functionality and the right um, uh, features and yep. usability for for the the sales workforce to to make sure that they adopt it. So and there we see still some uh, challenges in the company, but we have some strong plans to to improve there. But here you can see that that we have quite some. Uh, connected uh, mm -hmm. sweet solutions uh, I, and I forgot even one, uh, the Coupa one where we have the procurement suite uh, yeah. uh, which we are currently also implementing. So we are, we are doing quite some big strategic programs uh, yeah. in the company. I'm very proud that, uh, to be part of that one, mm -hmm. to, uh, to build it. But it comes with yeah, what I call the, the IM 2.0 workforce uh, because you need much more knowledge about the integration aspects between those platforms, mm -hmm. how the data is flowing, uh, where's the source of the data. Uh, if you talk about glossiness of a product which you need on your uh, websites, uh, where is, uh, does it come from the uh, you know, innovate platforms uh, we have, come, does it come from the ERP system, uh, where does it go, where is it enriched, yeah. and all that concepts, uh, more device agnostic knowledge about data flows and data structures and data models, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what we need to uh, learn on more. And in our current workforce and in our past workforce we had much more people who are experts about the solution itself, the technical knowledge, yeah. which was also very important and is still very important when you have on-premise solutions where you do a lot of custom coding and yeah. building. But yeah, I hope more and more we can leverage uh, the, the investment of, of many smart people, implement a lot of companies uh, in SaaS solutions so yeah. that we can adopt it. But then the integration becomes very important and, and getting the integration right and, and smooth, that's not an easy thing either, right? No, and that's why I think where the value added of my team can come from, eh, from uh, the knowledge of the data, the processes and the integration flows. Yeah. That is key for the future, I believe. Okay. You talked a bit about uh, open source in, 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 in your CRM. Is open source in general an, uh, a strategy for you guys? Is that an important thing in the company? Yeah, for, for that uh, example I mentioned it is. Uh, we do it uh, a little bit more, but, uh, but not strategically mm -hmm. uh, a lot. Um, we are, in the, in the data space, we're building quite a few uh, solutions ourselves, uh, mm -hmm. specifically with the supply chain. Uh, what we call the so-called art house, where we bring all the data points from the different systems together and try to better forecast and make a, a proper demand, supply mm -hmm. planning, manufacturing plan. Yeah, we use a lot of our custom built uh, programs and, and uh, analytics uh, in, in the art house, as yeah. we call it in, the, in our Azure data lake mm -hmm. and, uh, and other tooling uh, around that. So there we use uh, a little bit more of what we uh, build and develop ourselves. Okay. But um, but not uh, most of the parts. We we try to uh, stick to standards. Stick to standard and, platforms. And, uh, okay. Off the shelf rather than build it ourselves. Yeah. Marco, let's talk a bit about how IT is organized uh, within uh, within Axon Nobel. Um, let's start maybe with give us a rough estimate of how much are you spending on 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 on, on IT if if you can uh, disclose that. Uh, because typically in an industry, production industry like yours, it will be in a percentage and a half, two percent. Uh, I, I can imagine that that could be similar in your case. Yeah, I think uh, to, to, not, to go not too much in detail, but I think it's fair to say that we're roughly at, at two percent of revenues mm -hmm. right now. But that includes all our major strategic investments of those sweet solutions uh, I was referring to, yeah. uh, that uh, the, the big uh, OMP implementation, yep. the, the Coupa implementation, the PRISM consolidation. So there's, yep. uh, there's a, a large part of our spend is currently on, uh, on investing in these uh, strategic platforms okay. to really take out complexity and cost. It's, it's uh, a bit difficult to benchmark ourselves because we are still considered to be part of the, the chemical industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do also uh, B2C, for example. So retail uh, sometimes is a better uh, comparison because, uh, for example, we have uh, over 500 stores in Europe mm -hmm. um, and the biggest portion of that is in, in the UK, but 500 stores in total and that, um, yeah, that comes with a different uh, IT footprint, for example, but yeah. also um, the websites we have uh, to facilitate the B2C uh, business is, uh, is also requiring. Uh, we have many locations uh, as a result of the stores. Yeah. Uh, so 
we created our own um, yeah, mix, a blend of, uh, of, uh, of that. Uh, to uh, to come to kind of a benchmark what 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 yeah. good, uh, good looks like and that's a little bit uh, below uh, the levels we are now but but for the major part it's caused by the high investment levels okay. we currently have okay. but um, but we did a massive reorganization of our uh, function uh, by first combining the functions and then we went to uh, to an outsource model uh, because uh, all our run operations, in fact, are uh, yeah, nearly 100% outsourced. Okay. Uh, outsourced. So you're massively outsourced then? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So how many people would you say you have in total and how many are your people on your payroll? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That I, 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 I know uh, we have around two, 300, 350 uh, in that order of magnitude currently employed uh -huh. uh, on the payroll, internal people. but. Uh, yeah, we have still a multiple of people, uh, external consultants and managers working on projects and mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to manage these bigger programs we have. Yeah. And that's easily another uh, 500 uh, people. And then in the run, yeah, we have, uh, we have outsourced and uh, you, you, you can easily add another, maybe 1,500, I don't know. Eh? Yeah. Uh, it, because mostly it's a managed service yeah. and we're actually not even concerned about, uh, directly at least, uh, on how many people do that proper service. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's really a service. And um, of course, we, 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 we have some estimates because they need access to our systems. So, so we, we know that. Uh, but uh, I can not give an accurate number uh, uh, from the top so of my heart. Order of magnitude, about 2,000 people, let's say more or less, a couple of hundred more or less, probably more. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so also a couple of hundred million in, 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 uh, yeah. in, in cost or spent yeah. as well. Yeah. So, and how you say run is, is uh, at the operations, the run is outsourced. Um, what, what are the major, yeah, major partners there? So uh, the, the run part is what we call, uh, is managed through our uh, global business services organization in Axe Nobel. And uh, that's not only IT, but also the HR uh, okay. operations, uh, finance operations, MDM operations. So it's a really a global business service organization. And IT is a big part of it, of course. Yep. And, and that, is, uh, that is not in my remit, but, but in, uh, with a colleague uh, in the I'm leadership uh, yep. team. And um, yeah, if you look at there, we, our ma major parties are um, Atos, uh, who is responsible for um, hosting and orchestration, mm -hmm. uh, Tata Consultancy Services for our application management support, yeah. Orange Business Services for our connectivity support. Um, and then, um, yeah, we have some, uh, some other parties as well, uh, like ACL is uh, managing our workplace uh, Predominantly, and yeah. then we have uh, the biggest parties, but uh, but also some some smaller parties. Uh. Okay, and so you have the in in IT you have the, the the run part mostly outsourced. You run the the, the solutions part, and 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 and, and with, with your team. Yeah. What are the other teams are there still um, in in the IT organization? Yeah, so that is uh, uh, well reflected as you just stated it. So that's uh, that's good. And then we uh, have the CEO office mm -hmm. where in where we also deal with uh, compliance, security, PMO office, okay. project methodologies, agile uh, transformation, mm -hmm. uh, and also the enterprise architects are residing there. So we okay. uh, we are kind of defining uh, the the. The enterprise principles, uh, the the constraints within where my people need to operate into. Okay. Uh, so that's CEO office, and then we have also the demand function, as we call it, uh, where the business information managers are kind of the the account executives to uh, to interact with the business yep. and uh, gather the requirements, uh, help them to prioritize all the projects they need to do, and uh, and explain and and deal with the how how the IT operations is uh, and 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 the I am team as a whole is organized. So that is uh, that are the key strategic uh, yeah, responsibilities of the demand function or the business information function. So four main groups, demand, CIO office, your solutions group, and then the, the, the run part. Yeah. You said that uh, one of the, of the goals is to become a, a much more flexible organization and, and, and IT needs to su support that flexibility. Agility is very important. Can you talk a little bit about that, how far you are in that agile road and, and, uh, and, and how IT and business are, are working together in, in Axonobel? 
Yeah, so the two aspects of agility in, in my belief. The first of it, we, we already talked a little bit about that. That's about the complexity of the landscape and, uh, and, and um, uh, what, what makes it more complex and uh, uh, to, to run projects. So from mm -hmm. that perspective, uh, we should take our complexity to be able to, to, uh, to better respond to the changing needs and, and, and execute projects. But agility, uh, agility as a methodology, I think we are still on the journey to learn that. We do quite a few projects already in an agile way, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a bit of a challenging eh, because we have that difference between the run and the CUE and the change. Eh, so how are we going to work together? Yeah. Also the, uh, the awareness of the business, eh, because if you uh, want to work agile, you need also to make sure that the businesses uh, can understand the, the agile yep. way of working. Uh, you, uh, it takes two to tango to, uh, to really uh, work well together and to be uh, effective and, uh, and, uh, and productive. But there we are still, uh, so that's why we also have a agile transformation offer to, to, uh, to make sure that everybody gets the awareness, get the training, yep. um, um, help the projects to, to work in that agile way. Yep. Um, but still, it's, uh, it, it's yeah. I still struggle how that will uh, work in the in, in the company because um, yeah, we have these big ERP system. They're becoming even bigger, bigger, bigger. So, to if an agile project in in e-commerce requires a change in your backbone, yeah, that cannot happen overnight. Eh? So, uh, and the sprints are maybe a short period uh, in which you try to uh, to build it. But if that doesn't fit in the overall uh, upgrade plan mm -hmm. or release calendar of the of the big uh, ERP system. Yeah, then you already, yeah, what we call uh, have that uh, conflict between the mode one and mode two operations. Yep. Uh, so that's uh, yeah, that is really where we still need to learn how we can best uh, organize ourselves for that because. Yeah, we believe that Agile can be much more value of Axonbell than, than we do today. No. But uh, we also believe that not every project and every um, platform can be managed in such a way. So um, uh, if, if we, we, I'm not going to call out the numbers, but if, if our EOP system is down for a few hours, it's it has a massive a impact <laughs> because we have such a deep integration with our some state-of-the-art manufacturing plans we have yeah. across the globe that that every hour outage will immediately have impact uh, and, 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 uh, and soon we then need to shut down production if that's... Um, that would be the case. So that um, that requires careful testing, scheduling, planning, um, yeah, and that uh, that sometimes um, yeah is a struggle to uh, yeah. to to deal with. Marco, let's talk a little bit more about uh, your role. Um, so what is it exactly that you and, and and your team does, and 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 where do you spend most of your time? Yeah. So first about uh, the team. Uh, I think we have a team of about 120 people, and about half of them are architect, and the other half is uh, project consultant. And and the architects they are more uh, responsible for the, the 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 early start of the project, or the the even the steps before the start of the project. Mm -hmm. So in in the application or tool selection, uh, translating requirements into a high level design, making uh, project start architectures, security assessments, etc. So that's uh, that's a key role of these architects, and also how how that new solution or change has impact on the integration, the data, uh, the connectivity, and and that kind of stuff. So that's what uh, architects uh, mostly mm -hmm. do in the execution phase or in the sprints. Uh, then project consultants are typically more involved into the actually detail design it and to build it. And they do that together with our uh, external project consultants yep. and uh, project managers. So that there you see really the blend of an internal pool and an external pool, and they can complement each other. And uh, and that's by design eh, because uh, yeah we believe that internal people can be uh, cost efficient uh, for projects, but also they they capture much more process and actionable knowledge, but also the the way we we run programs and what and what uh, what needs to be done internally. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but sometimes you need also have that flexibility because uh, you don't want to have a big uh, uh, project group of people uh, while you don't have a, a few vision yet on the pipeline for the future. Mm. And sometimes you only need certain expertise for a certain period and yep. you don't like to have them sustainably in, in your company. And then you make use of external resources. Okay. But currently we are, we are a little bit, um, 
of road eh, because um, we have too many externals uh, if you if you look at the ratio compared to internal so uh, we, we depend too much on externals right now so we're revisiting that to make sure okay. that we have a more balanced group my personally yeah, I'm, I'm I'm trying to look for optimizations uh, try to help and, and coach my team uh, try to lead by example by by having uh, yeah good involvement in, in all the ambitions the company have translating that in how we need to change our IT organization mm -hmm. how we need to work differently how to drive continuous improvements and, and continuous looking for cost optimization because the Action Nobel is still in this grow and deliver strategy and deliver means also still looking at cost uh, efficiency opportunities in mm -hmm. the company. Um, and that's uh, that's what, uh, what also keeps me uh, busy right now. But uh, yeah, we have so many projects right now and, and, and try to governance and steer that and, and, and keep a close eye and make sure that people keep a close eye on the dependencies between those large programs. Yeah, that's my main concern, but also my, my key activities. Uh, okay. And how would you, I mean, you have quite a, quite a team and, and, and two uh, groups and then a lot of external people in there as well. So how would you describe your management style? How is it, what is, what is your secret for building uh, successful teams? Yeah, I, I mentioned already lead, uh, leading by example. So uh, hardworking, uh, yeah, loyal, trustworthy, open, mm -hmm. easy, accessible. So that's what I try to show and also, uh, yeah, hope to, to see back from my, uh, my team and externals as well. So that is one, uh, it, but I also seek consultancy, I seek for advice. I don't pretend to have all the knowledge in my head. Uh, I don't have a strong, necessarily strong vision on anything. Uh, I think um, showing your weaknesses uh, is, is a strength actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that's what I try to also uh, show. Uh, I, I can raise stupid questions. I, I don't necessarily know anything and I, I can also, I don't have problems to display it. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually a strength because if you don't know your weaknesses, then, uh, then you, then you uh, don't acknowledge it and maybe uh, make uh, wrong decisions. So mm -hmm. it's a strength to, to know your weaknesses yeah. and, and, how, and I don't care displaying it. Uh, how easy is it for, uh, for your IT organization in, in a paint and coating business to attract uh, uh, top talent in IT? Yeah, today it's really a big challenge uh, mm -hmm. for us. Uh, of course, um, uh, Axonbel is a large corporate company. Uh, historically, that was a good place for, for many people to go and yeah. to apply for. Uh, but also these days, uh, there are also many people who would like to work for smaller companies, more flexible, more, uh, uh, more family-driven uh, uh, and, and more maybe a yeah, different culture different aspects mm -hmm. but um, i think uh, axonbel is still strong uh, reputation and, and you see a lot of people still willing to work for axonbel uh, but it's uh, it's i think it's an increasing challenge uh, mm -hmm. for for corporates in general i think yeah. but also specifically uh, i think axonbel is not uh, excluded from that but they must be doing something good if you almost work for 25 years there so there's, there must be an an interesting culture as well no yeah, I like. Uh, yeah, because uh, I've, I've, I've been lucky because I got that so many opportunities to do something completely different, yeah. to go outside my boundaries, mm -hmm. outside my comfort zone. Uh, when I moved to IT, I didn't dip that education. Uh, I, uh, I just stepped up in that uh, space and then learned by doing. Uh, did some extra training, executive uh, programs like on uh, INSEAD in France, but both many programs I. Uh, I could do, um, yeah, and, and I've been given the opportunity so many yeah. times, and I, um, of course, you, at the end you, you do it yourself because I, I've proven that I can do these out of the, the box and uh, outside my comfort zone, but yeah, it's always Axonbel who yeah. gave me that opportunity to do so, and I think that uh, yeah, that is one of the elements I, I still like. Yeah. But it's maybe uh, when I, um, talk more about that i always wonder why why i stick so long with this company <laughs> but uh, again it's the uh, the opportunities i've been given but also uh, it's a little bit if you look at my profile i'm i'm loyal and um, i stick to uh, an intimate group of people i mm -hmm. work with also in family friend life so 
I think that makes me, uh, I don't easily give up or get uh, uh, done with, with certain things. So um, that's why it also keep me uh, going with Nocturnal Ball. But I, I need to enjoy work, otherwise I, uh, I, I quit or I, I will stop because that, that, uh, it's, uh, it's too big part of your life to, uh, <laughs> to be frustrated or uh, annoyed about. So. Let's talk about leadership. How would you describe in general leadership style in, in, in your organization? How would you describe your own leadership style? What is the, the leadership style that you prefer in, in, in your own teams? That How do you coach your people on leadership style? Yeah, again, uh, I, 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 I like to lead by example. I, I, I really uh, are demanding, are critical to people as well. So, um, But at the same time, they can say anything to me. They can also... Um, challenge me back and they do mm -hmm. uh, so they I think uh, quite a few feel me uh, as one of them uh, so that I can easily uh, work with and engage with and relate to mm -hmm. um, but what do you think you, your people will say about you when you're not around when they talk amongst themselves you're not there how do you think you're perceived <laughs> why is she still there <laughs> no no I, I think he's um, I think um, they would consider me as, as somebody who is hardworking, a big, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a huge uh, work ethos. Uh, so really uh, uh, like working, uh, is very engaged, very dedicated, um, but also demanding. So I, I put a lot of uh, bars for myself. Yeah. And sometimes I, I raise the bar also to uh, my people so that uh, um, that, uh, that can be uh, maybe perceived as something uh, which puts them on pressure. Uh, uh, but I think they, and I, I like to have an informal work culture. I like uh, uh, to make fun, to have a laugh. So that's, I, I hope, how they uh, will describe me. Okay. Uh, so that's, um, but I always, uh, I, I think I have an ability to deliver as well. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I sometimes I, we have people in our organization who, who, um, we always, if you if you need to balance between uh, quality and time, that they always choose for quality and then uh, delay the delivery of time. And so I, I keep wondering why why that's always the case. Because why why is always time the sacrifice of uh, of anything which you need to do? Yeah. And I think personally myself, I, I have that ability to deliver. And sometimes maybe eighty percent or ninety percent of quality is good enough yeah. uh, because the the actual delivery. Is more important for the company or for that specific project. Okay. Marco, let's talk a little bit more about your personality. Uh, because I think leadership and, and success in leadership has to do with how you wired as a person and, 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 and so on. And you were so good to share with us your MBTI uh, profile, your Myers Briggs uh, type indicator. And you are, you are an ESFJ uh, uh, in MBTI, it's also known as a console. And that is a person with extroverted, observant, feeling and judging personality traits. And these are typically people that are attentive and they're people focused and they enjoy taking part in this social community. And their achievements are guided by decisive values and they uh, uh, willingly offer guidance to others. So that's how your personality type is described. Now, what I'm going to give you is first a couple of strengths of people with your profile and then a couple of weaknesses. Uh, so I want you to reflect on what are the strengths that you recognize uh, and, and what are the weaknesses that you recognize and how did you overcome the weaknesses, of course. So strengths for people uh, who have the console uh, personality type is that they have strong practical skills. They have a strong sense of duty, you already uh, touched on that, very loyal. Uh, sensitive, warm, and they're good at connecting with others. Does that fit the bill? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So that's, um, yeah, I, I looked also at the profile uh, and um, <laughs> there was actually some, somewhere mentioned handwriting was perfect with those people, but that I didn't recognize <laughs> really. <laughs> but no, I think overall, uh, joking apart, I think they, uh, they, they, they quite, I, I always find it amazing how these Profiles resonate with how you are. Uh, well, of it's course, self-test. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But so it should but. fit your own <laughs> your own view. Now, more interesting, of course, are the weaknesses, the development areas. Let's call them. And so, to be a successful uh, top uh, digital leader, you need to overcome your 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 personal weaknesses. So, 
people with your personality type, they sometimes they are worried about the social status. They can sometimes be inflexible. They can be reluctant to innovation and improvisation. They are vulnerable to criticism. They are sometimes too needy or too selfless. So which one of these stand out for you? Where, which one do you recognize and how have you overcome? How do you work on that? Yeah, I think uh, vulnerability to uh, how criticism, I think it mm -hmm. was uh, uh, referred to. I, I, I kind of uh, recognize that because okay. in my profile and I think uh, the sensing, uh, I, I like to work on facts and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and do careful consideration of anything what I, uh, I do. Yeah. Um, I also have a high level of empathy, so when I go to somebody where I need to convince somebody of get consent of something, mm -hmm. I well prepare uh, and I empathize with the, with the thinking of this person to, to, to make sure that I can tell the story in his or her words. Okay. Um, and, and, and I wonder, okay, what would I do uh, to, uh, to make the call? What kind of information do I need? Mm -hmm. and, and, and how would it resonate with me? Because uh, for me, this is maybe a priority, but for the other person, it's maybe one of the 10 priorities. So mm -hmm. how do I trigger it? How can I make a condensed story? So I, I, I really well prepared. Mm -hmm. I carefully consider the scenarios and the options. So I take a lot of time into it. So if then somebody still has questions or concerns or criticism, then I, I take it sometimes personal because yes. yeah, I think I did my job. Uh, so, and, and, and that's how, maybe- And how do you manage that then? If, if, if one of your collaborators or a manager gives you serious criticism, how do you live with that then? Yeah, uh, I deal with it better every day. So, <laughs> no, that can be uh, because first of all, uh, enough in my work life, and that's I think uh, a compliment to the company I work for is that that uh, in it, it's never almost never personal. Eh? So people have criticism or uh, a challenge you uh, because of the content or yeah. or the, the 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 way you are put into. Uh, in, the, in this work or in the story or whatever you, you do, but they don't uh, make it very personal. So, and therefore you should not also take it personal. And mm -hmm. that's what I've learned over the years. Uh, but if you keep that in mind uh, and, and go uh, for that, assume that for a minute, then, then I think that helps a lot already. Yeah. And then, um, then you need to reflect it on yourself and say, yeah, maybe I have not told it in the right way. I didn't socialize it enough or, uh, because sometimes it takes a couple of iterations so I try to reflect it on the, on the way I have yeah. approached this apparently and, and look for ways to improve that moving forward so okay. I try to uh, translate it into a learning to do it uh, no. next time better. I also want to discuss the S with you, the S on sensing mm -hmm. so facts and data and, and, and the, it's very very important for you. Yeah. But sometimes it's impossible to have all the facts. So in your decision making, how, how, how difficult or easy is that for you that you need to know all the facts before you can make a decision? Yeah, like I, I just referred to, huh? I, I now can criticize uh, uh, people or uh, projects to, uh, to, to, to look for a balance between the time constraint and the scope constraint, mm -hmm. huh? so that you not always should uh, sacrifice time. But I, that I learned also myself. So, so I. I learned more and more to deal with uh, decision making with the with a certain facts at hand. But I will try still to do more facts gathering as much as possible. And if that requires a little bit more work for me, I will do so. So right. that that comes a little bit with a with a risk for myself of my balance uh, in yep. personal life to to make sure that I uh, I gather as much as possible information. But I. I stick to the, to, the, to the deadlines I set to myself or, or of whatever I agreed with whoever in that mm -hmm. organization to, to enforce myself to take that decision on that point in time, yeah. whatever information is there. So, and that can be 80% of the information, can be 90%. But I, 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 yeah, I still, my weakness is still that I will put great effort into uh, getting as much as information uh, in there. But yeah, in the, in, the, in the steps I've made in the company, I also learned that uh, sometimes you're looking for details which, which doesn't have a big impact on the overall total. Mm -hmm. So you, I learned more to, to balance the relevance of the data facts I maybe want to gather, but if they don't drive the outcome 
significantly, yeah. then I will just ignore it and, uh, and assume things. Okay. So that's uh, what I've learned to, uh, to, to read what the, the importance of uh, these elements are, which, yeah. I, which I need to, to do the decision making. But I, I um, so that's, uh, that's one of the, uh, yeah, the weaknesses to, uh, to put a lot of effort into uh, g gathering facts. And are I can overthink things, so uh, decision making. So if I if I'm uh, forced to take the decisions, then I will uh, I will take decisions. Uh, but um, if uh, yeah, that that's a little, sometimes a little bit out of my comfort zone to oh. uh, to make. But you're good with people, so I mean, you can if you have good teams, you can rely on your people to to yeah. bring you the right information to make decisions. No. Yeah, and that's the other uh, things I learned from my profile, and, and maybe the weakness in the past is that I, I I was looking maybe sometimes for people with the similar profile or the similar character because I don't necessarily like conflicts. I learned that also that uh, that you cannot be liked by everybody, so that that uh, that's something I also learned along the way. But, uh, but it was still a little bit in my nature. And then in one of these big programs, I learned that, that, uh, that I worked with a person who was completely the opposite of me. And uh, we, 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 uh, we didn't become real friends. It was a little bit uh, complicated. Uh, so at the point I uh, t wanted to replace that person, I, I realized that just in time that uh, I, I should not look for a second Marco, but uh, just keep working with him because he was actually very complimentary to to uh, to me yeah. uh, and actually together we were a great team but yeah we we not necessarily became friends or whatever but yeah. uh, but but it was in the benefit of the project and the benefit of the company so that is one of my yeah that is one of the weaknesses you could see in, in this profile as well that you uh, that you try to avoid conflicts and look for people uh, with similarities, and uh, but that I uh, I learned to, uh, to to not look for that because yeah, otherwise you are not open to new ideas, yep. to uh, to other ways of thinking. Uh, so I like to bring people and teams together who uh, who are different from me. Well, in the beginning you talked about diversity, inclusion. Is 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 that also in IT something that is that you can realize? Yeah, the, uh, the diversity in terms of uh, nationalities or uh, backgrounds, I mm -hmm. think we are quite good at that, but diversity in gender is really a challenge for us. So yeah, currently we are yeah, still below our own targets we set in our uh, people, planet and prof, uh, paint uh, yeah. uh, philosophy in the company, but, uh, but also in IT it's even worse in Axnobel. So Axnobel as a total still needs to improve. But uh, in IT specifically, it's really uh, below uh, par yet. Right. But here, I think um, we it, sometimes it's it's the selection process. But I, I did some analysis on data points, <laughs> <laughs> and then I learned that actually people, if you look at the applications, the number of applicants actually um, that was there, you see that already the intake was uh, the on, on gender diversity was. Very already old. below par. So actually we had difficulties to apparently attract people to even apply for the job. Eh? And so the problem is not necessarily in the selection process, but more in how they, how they can yep. be attracted to, uh, to work in IT for a company like Axnobel. So I think here is still work to be done to, to set up a profile when we uh, share uh, uh, vacancies on social media, yep. how how to tell the story differently to, to attract the right people. Eh? The, uh, and then I talk about um, age, eh? the, the younger people, but also uh, uh, to better balance the, the gender diversity. Oh. So I think there's, it's, it's, it's not only the internal process, it's, it's much more how we can become a more appealing company for those uh, targeted uh, groups of people. Okay. Marco, my favorite question of these interviews is the following one. And that is, you have had a very successful career, almost 25 years in a big corporate, and so you made a lot of success, but I'm sure you also had your failures. And so, and it's from our failures that we, that we can learn. So, um, could you share with us maybe what was one of your most brilliant failures, and in the sense that there was a big learning out, something that, that, that maybe went wrong, and that and, uh, you could have done better. And, uh, but w share with us your most brilliant failure. 
<laughs> yeah, the, the, the example I, uh, I, would l I wanted to use is actually what, what we just talked about, is that I, I was always, of always, I was looking for similar profiles as myself. Yeah. And then I think uh, yeah, that, that, that resulted almost in a project failure because um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I wanted to replace some of the really good people who actually were a great uh, value to that project to, to replace them with profiles which result into less conflicts with me as a person. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, in, in fact became then copycats of my uh, Marco and yeah. then uh, yeah that I think was not good for the project so okay. actually just before um, that was about to happen I, I uh, intervened and, and learned by by having some conversations with people so uh, because I like to interact with people that I that I learned okay this is not the way forward I need to sacrifice my my maybe uh, my relationship for for this for the interest of the of the of the company and for mm -hmm. the project so I think that's one of the the biggest learnings um, I had in this uh, okay. this company, and and what I also learned, uh, and that was one of these uh, programs I I, uh, I was allowed to do within uh, this company to further develop myself, is that I have uh, an enormous drive to uh, prove myself, mm -hmm. and that's I think also uh, one of the characteristics of that profile. But that, that if you are not careful and that almost happens, then that will drive you to work so many days and nights to, to every time prove that you can do the job and that, you, that you're ready for the next step. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that um, and I learned by, okay, but this brought me where, to where I am today, right? Yeah. Uh, because I, I have these 11 career steps in the company and that, that, that kind of profile helped me to get here. So I cannot, I cannot leave that behind because that made me to where I were yeah. and, and where I am today. But that, but I, that's what I also learned is that yeah, that that's maybe not necessarily true eh? because yeah, that uh, this effect that it helped me to where, get there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it uh, remains to be there to get to the next level or the next step. So, yeah. I. I think I need to realize that I, I can do things because otherwise I would not be in this mm -hmm. position. So I don't necessarily need to prove that every day. No. So that is, that's one of the, the other things I, I, I need. So, so I you learned. work long days, long hours, long weeks. So, so what do you do? How do you relax? When, uh, or do you take your, your problems uh, home and you continue working on them at home? Or what, how, what do you do to relax? So my wife studied uh, psychology, so she, she helps me there, <laughs> but also to pull the brake every now and then. So uh -huh. I think I found a better balance in the last couple of years, but there were some couple of bad uh, years that I, uh, the balance was not right. So it didn't hurt me personally, but uh, yeah, that was. Uh, so I think family, uh, I have three kids mm -hmm. uh, in the age of 20, 18 and 16, and they uh, they are a big inspiration for me because I, I love the, the family life. We go still together on a holiday for as long as it uh, still takes. But uh, I spend some time with them. It's really good and uh, with mm -hmm. my wife and, uh, and, uh, and, and socialize also with my family. Uh, I spend a lot of time doing that. And I like to do sports, uh, team sports. Uh, so uh, padel, of uh, that's the, yeah, of course. <laughs> Padel is what I do a lot uh, these days. Uh, I'm still not uh, the expert here, but uh, I love doing it. It's, it's now the fastest go growing sport in Europe. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I started about four years ago when there were still uh, a few courts uh, in the Netherlands, but now it's yeah really popular. But uh, yeah, I look, like doing that. And, okay. uh, so that's, uh, that's a bit about uh, yeah, the family life. And I have two brothers and two sisters and my father is still alive and um, doing well so i like to spend some time with them as well what what are the the values that you got from from your family from your father and what are the values that you're passing on to your children yeah first of all respect uh, I, I have enormous respect for my father because um, i and and i only realized that when uh, when when i uh, and my wife got kids is that uh, that the family life is so important and that uh, that it is so impactful because yeah, my mother passed away when I was four uh, yeah. and, and my father was left behind with five kids in the age of two, four, six, eight and ten. So 
And uh, I didn't realize that so much at the time, but that was so, must be so impactful for him. It's still difficult to talk about it uh, with him, but I, I so much deeply respect on him to not give up, keep loyal to his family and to take care of his family. And that's, that's I think, what you also see now back in my life, but also in my working life, to never give up. Uh, it's, it's too easy to uh, walk away from things, to look for another job, another company. Mm -hmm. I, I don't typically give up. And, and, and my father comes, uh, he had a small own business, so he had to work long days as well, so uh, a high work ethos. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's something I think also inherited somehow to uh, to uh, to work hard because no. uh, if you work hard, that's also one of my uh, mantras. Then uh, then it will bring uh, fruition, huh? so then it will deliver results mm -hmm. to uh, to do that. So I think that's what uh, what was uh, brought to me. But uh, yeah, it was a big sacrifice to to do that huh? because uh, if you are only picture yourself in the situation of my father then. Uh, but he did, apparently did a great job then. Um. I think so, yeah, yeah. no doubt. Uh, yeah, he's a big uh, example for me and inspiration for me. If you look back on your, on your personal life, I mean, you grew up in, in, with a warm father, did a great job. Uh, and um, uh, what was the, the best thing that has ever happened to you? Um, yeah, I think we, as a result, uh, so again, a big, uh, a sacrifice but as a result we had a very strong family bond uh, so uh, I think we we still have that so I'm really happy with that but for me the most impactful thing is to to uh, to start my own of uh, yeah to uh, to to raise my children to mm -hmm. to uh, to start your own family actually to uh, uh, to raise your own children and, uh, and make difficult decisions in that uh, as well uh, because uh, yeah I career-wise I could move to other places in the world, but um, I decided not to do that in the, in the interest of one of my uh, children who needs to have a more stable environment at that point in life. So yeah, you, you had to make some choices, some difficult choices, and yeah. I'm really proud that I did it, to not uh, sacrifice his, his future for my career. Uh, and that, that is not, uh, uh, was at the end not a difficult thing, but uh, but an important thing, which I'm still proud of uh, today, to yeah. to have made that important decision to to uh, to choose for family. Yeah. So your family is super important. So that's one of the things that you must love most in your life. So what what is it that you fear most in your life? Yeah, for a while that was uh, the same as what happened to uh, my father, right? So that that I would be left alone or I would uh, uh, be gone or uh, something will happen to my kids and that's mm -hmm. still a worry today, of course. Uh, not uh, not uh, that I don't sleep at night, but that's still, uh, now your kids are also going on holiday, so I'm, uh, yeah, you know the age. So letting them, them go about, is, let is them a thing? Go is, uh, is really yeah. difficult yeah, uh, yeah. because uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, sometimes a strange world outside. Eh? Yeah. So my yeah. wife is a, a social therapist in, uh, in a mental institute. So we, we see examples every day on uh, what kind of people are also in this world, yeah. uh, which deserves attention and, and deserves also uh, um, treatment. But yeah, they are also, uh, yeah, something can, ha can happen to your own kids. Uh, yeah. And, and that is, uh, that's something what I worry about. If we look back at your, um, at your business career, uh, who were the important figures, mentors, people that you learned from, or maybe public figures? Who are the people that you look up to and that, you, uh, that were important in your life? Yeah, I, I, what a good example is, uh, is what, what, what currently is happening with, uh, with Tesla, with Elon Musk. Uh, so uh, what he's, because I'm not so, I, I, I like to engage and get a lot of energy from people, but I'm not uh, necessarily always the person that, uh, that is on stage or uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, is proud and, and, uh, to, about himself, but also share all the ideas to anyone in the world. So I, I'm a, a kind of jealous on how people like he is doing that actually you have to have an example have that strategic view and just go for it uh, also not giving up but also have that vision and and exploit that uh, to the world and now uh, doesn't take any resistance or 
or criticism to uh, to change his route, and mm -hmm. that is something what uh, what I really like. Uh, but those type of people, uh, I can uh, I can uh, look up to. Yeah. yeah, he's an inspirational guy to, to say the least. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, there also, he has also some weaknesses. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> But uh, let's not talk about it here now. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, that, that's a positive element mm -hmm. of it too. Uh, because uh, yeah, I grew up as a, uh, as a more Calvinistic uh, way, uh, the, what uh, what the Dutch are typically maybe are is to uh, to do normal and uh, don't put yourself too much uh, in in the front. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's 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 what certainly is not applicable for uh, Elon Musk. But uh, but yeah, that's uh, how I. Uh, live my life. Okay. Marco, do you have a personal mantra, a saying that helps you in difficult times or that, that inspires you? Yeah, but, uh, but what, what comes to mind at first is that, uh, that, that you are responsible for your own destiny, for your own happiness. I think that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that comes uh, closest to what I believe is important for, for anyone actually, because uh, when you talk a lot uh, with other people, uh, some people complain about things or um, uh, don't like necessarily things, and that that is all fine eh? if you if you look at the value uh, uh, the, the value of change, right? That you uh, that people can be temporarily upset about the change or the uh, or how things are happening. But I think at the end, if you don't like things, then you need to take control eh? because you if you if you don't like it then you need to take the the, the control and, and make a change mm -hmm. so if that work wise if you don't like it anymore then you need to take uh, take another job or leave the company um, or you need to uh, manage the situation eh? but because if you complain then you yeah then 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 nothing will change necessarily and if you are looking for somebody else to change and and if you're not happy then uh, then you cannot uh, blame, I think, uh, anybody else for that. I oh. think at the end you need to take control. And I think, of course, there are many people in the world who, uh, who are unlucky and, uh, and get a lot of um, setbacks. But I think, uh, for mo and, and uh, I, I can understand all of that, but it's very important that, that you take control where possible. I think there's a lot you can do yourself to determine your own future and happiness. And, and if you look at your work relation, don't don't look at your manager to to have that uh, arranged for you. Huh? That no. uh, that happiness that uh, we can help as management. We can help people to develop and to move and give responsibilities and uh, and try something out. But at the end, uh, people need to make that choice yeah, and, and to need to embrace it. In the end, you're responsible for your own success and, yeah. and your own decisions and. Uh, and yeah. Absolutely. Marco, these videos are uh, watched by um, many people, in, in mostly in our industry, but also by young people that have the ambition to become a, a top digital leader in a big corporate. So looking back on your almost 25 years career, what are the, what's the advice that you would give to your younger self or what's the advice that you would give to ambitious digital leaders that want to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, I, I personally would, uh, that you need to start somewhere and that you need to, I would go for the incremental steps and look for the opportunities on the, on the, on the road. I think if you put a dot on the horizon on the career where you want to go or want to become, uh, from the start, I, I don't think that necessarily will help you. So I, I, I would advise them to, to look for a nice opportunity uh, embrace that opportunity, uh, make it a success. Don't give up overnight. Uh, if you are, get a few setbacks, move uh, to a different job or a different company, don't do that. Uh, don't, uh, it comes with setbacks. Every step, also in personal life, comes with setbacks. But, uh, but embrace them and learn from it, mm -hmm. and then take uh, another opportunity. They will come to you if you work hard, uh, you work, uh, do a good job, or uh, otherwise you need to seek that, uh, seek that opportunity. But I, I, I would do it step by step and, and because you can change route. I, I changed route over time. I, I had never the intention to become an IT leader, but now I am an IT leader. So yeah, that, that could um, never been done if I had to uh, put that dot on the horizon there. So you need to be, yeah, uh, embrace the opportunities which they come and uh, there will always come opportunities. And, 
I, I would advise that. And, and for young people working at the corporate, I think it's a really nice uh, place to be because you have these opportunities to do something different, to, mm -hmm. to, to think out the box, to think, uh, uh, to work on opportunities outside your comfort zone. Those are opportunities. And it is really amazing how you can work with these different cultures, different locations. Yeah. I've been lucky uh, pre-COVID times to travel the world, to see many countries, many other cultures, have foreign managers, managing global teams, uh, yeah. those kind of nice uh, elements of our international corporate is, uh, is uh, uh, for me and yeah. I think for a lot of young people appealing because you can see a lot and learn about their culture and in fact how small this little piece of Netherlands <laughs> is if you compare it to the rest of the world. Okay. But, uh, that's what I would uh, like to tell the people listening to this. Okay, and on that note Marco, thank you so much for being here with us today and thank you for sharing all your visions and your plans and your uh, and, and your ideas it was uh, it was really a pleasure thank you thank you for having me it was uh, nice uh, talking to you thank you thank you